start at the end? Well, hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Sea Alaska Heritage's Fall Lecture Series. My name is David Russell Jensen. My Shlingit name is Shaka Guk. Today is one of several free lectures during our lecture series this fall. We have a total of about 13 or more running through November. You can review the full schedule online at sealaskaheritage.org. At Sea Alaska Heritage, we're committed to providing accessible programming, but it wouldn't be possible without the help of donations. You can contribute online at sealaskaheritage.org slash donate or in person via the donation envelopes provided. Today's lecture is titled AD Clan Origin and Totem Pole and is presented by Dr. Edward K. Thomas. Thomas is President Emeritus of the Central Council of Klinka and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska, a recognition he earned after serving as president from 1984 until 2007 and again from 2010 to 2014. Dr. Thomas has lived a life of service, including with the Sea Alaska Board, the Alaska Native Brotherhood, Ketchikan Indian Community, Sean Seed Incorporated, the National Congress of American Indians, Alaska Federation of Natives, and more. He is a clan leader of the Sukhtinati clan. There is an opportunity for question and answer at the end. Please type your questions in the live stream, or if you're here in the audience, we can run a mic to you. Thank you, and Dr. Thomas. Cheers. Chau de nechi hat yi a de. Honorable people, thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here. Like I said, my name is Edward Thomas. I'm a Clinket. My Clinket name is Zahu, and I have another Clinket name of Shanskadek, and the Haida name of Skilkwidans. Uh, I'm I'm a raven. Uh, I'm of the Suktinadi clan. And I'll be talking about the uh, Suktinadi clan as I go through here. First, I want to thank the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute for not only having me here to speak about our totem and our clan, but also for doing the series. I think this does a great service to our communities to learn more about our culture and some of the activities that are going on here uh, at the Institute. I'm gonna begin my comments by talking about our homeland. Southeast Alaska, what Tlingit call Ani, is the homeland, is the ancestral homeland of the Tlingit people. And it's approximately 20 million acres in size. One of the things that I uh, advocate and uh, stress from time, every time I speak nowadays is that our Tlingit people have always been here since time, beginning of time. Now, uh, you hear about other uh, theories of origin, you know, whether it's biblical or Darwin or, you know, all those things, you know, but we have also our own perception as to how our people came about. And our homeland, Southeast Alaska, is made up of many islands. And if you look at this map, you can see that just about time of contact where our clans claim territory. <clears throat> now, while uh, this uh, map shows clan territory, I need to point out that it's the dominant clan because very often in your clan territories, you have both eagle and raven. Uh, but uh, uh, very often, not very often, but almost always when we claim territory, it's by the predominant clan. Tlingit and Haida nations have always been two separate and distinct nations. Legend has it that the, in ancient times, the Haida people uh, came from British Columbia, uh, uh, Queen Charlotte Islands, which is now known as Haida Gwaii. And on this map, you can see down on the bottom there, that's Queen Charlotte Islands used to be, but it's now called even by the Canadian government, Haida Gwaii. 
I'm going to talk uh, uh, about the makeup of our people into moieties, clans, and houses. I won't be talking too much about the houses uh, simply because of the time. <clears throat> the Clinket and Haida people uh, get their identity in a matrilineal clan system. In other words, we follow uh, the clan of our mother and uh, the clans are under the moieties, uh, but always we go by whether they're eagle or raven when we start talking about somebody marrying into the opposite. We're talking about marrying into the opposite moiety, not always just the clan. As I mentioned, we have uh, the eagle and the raven, but uh, sometimes in certain parts of our region, the eagle is interchangeable with the wolf, and uh, oftentimes the clan name will be more in tune with the old wolf uh, instead of uh, as an eagle. The way we uh, pass our heritage and our culture on from one generation to the next is through a cultural succession process, uh, which is in ancient times was passed on uh, personally well, when you had a uh, gathering, uh, whether it was a koich or celebrating somebody's life or uh, like in our situation, or celebrating uh, the erection of a totem pole. But these uh, ceremonies and uh, traditions that happen in these ceremonies are very important for us to uh, carry forth our culture. One other thing that uh, I'm going to be talking about as we go through this is that uh, the ceremonies serve also as a validation process. When a raven does something and you invite the eagle and there is no objection or there's participation, uh, then that's the validation of, the, of what you have accomplished and what you intend to do. Like I mentioned in my introduction, I'm Suktanedi, I'm a raven, a dog salmon. Uh, talk very little bit about uh, where our uh, clan homeland was prior to contact. And you'll see right in the middle of the Southeast Alaska, I have this uh, uh, label uh, pointing to Tebenkoff Bay. And Tebenkoff Bay is, uh, you can see up in the right-hand corner of Petersburg. It's about uh, 40 miles southwest of Petersburg and a little, more, little less than 25 miles just south of Cake. Our, our people really did like their traditional homelands and probably would have stayed longer. But when the uh, United States uh, uh, came to our homeland, uh, they start building schools in many of the communities, but not in all of the uh, clan territories. And they required uh, families with children to move to communities. So our uh, clan, which was located in Tebenka, uh, just a little bit away from Cake, most of our uh, clan moved to Cake, and uh, some moved uh, further south. Uh, but in the original movement, most of them went to Cake from, from Temenkoff Bay. And uh, later, when uh, we got more involved in fisheries, I didn't put it in my presentation here, but uh, they also moved further down. My parents moved down uh, to a place called Chican on the northern end of Prince of Wales Island, and then later down into Cloak. Cloak had three canneries. Uh, at that time, so it was really attractive for our people who were involved in fisheries uh, to move uh, to Cloak. Totem poles, uh, they are carving, carved of characters, uh, 
and tell of our ancient stories. They often include fish, eagles, bears, ravens, and other things. And uh, I'm not sure I know of the supernatural figure, but uh, when I was looking at this up, I, I noticed that was in there. Uh, but very often, the, the, uh, the birds and the animals reflect our clan. Uh, for example, on my pole, you'll have the uh, raven and then the dog salmon, so that uh, signifies our clan crest. Totems really were never uh, objects of, of worship. Uh, when I was uh, a youngster, uh, my mother was involved in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, church, and they believed very strongly that totems were another idol to worship as opposed to uh, simply reflecting a story of our people and as time went by, uh, they bought more into the reality that we didn't worship the poles, we used them to uh, carry our traditions forward and our culture forward. The Sukhtan AD, I call it an honor pole, and, and when we get to the part of explaining it in a minute here, you'll understand a little better why I call it that. It's located in a cemetery in Craig. And in our way of thinking, uh, cemeteries are sacred grounds where our, our past generations are laid to rest, and so those grounds are very sacred to us. And also, uh, by having the pole there in an honor fashion for those who are laid to rest, there also provides comfort to those who are remaining. This is uh, the verbiage that is on a plaque that I had uh, made for this poll, and it explains pretty much what we're doing. We're calling on the spirits of the Hash Hashika, our forefathers, uh, to honor those who are resting in those grounds and also to provide comfort to the families who remain. Because those families are the one holds together our communities in peace, prosperity, and fellowship. Jonathan Roan was not only the carver of the totem, but he also uh, put forth the story that would be reflected in his carving. And I'm very grateful for his uh, uh, years of experience and his knowledge about how totems work and, I mean, how the stories work in in carving a totem pole. He starts off by saying the top figure, uh, the figure that's wearing the dog salmon hat, uh, that represents the uncles. The middle, the raven in all his glory, that's his own term. I'm not sure totally what he meant by it, except that the raven looks a little content. Uh, so he said that that's the raven in all its glory, and he's the main figure in the totem pole. On the bottom, uh, you have the raven standing on the bentwood box, and it, it uh, represents uh, the keeping of clan treasures. Uh, what he means by that is not something uh, physical, but things that are abstract and things that are important to uh, not only this current, current clan, but something you pass on to the next generation. You're holding it in that box, but it's your responsibility then to carry it forward uh, to the next generation. And the uncles in our culture are the ones that are not only in charge, but are responsible for making sure that those treasures get passed on uh, to the next generation. I'm going to now move into uh, the actual process that we went through in, in raising the pole. Um, as, as in all things, we had to put together a schedule of events, and uh, we were going to have a two-day program, but uh, <clears throat> as uh, things go, you know, people get pressed for time and could not participate for two days like 
we were intending to do. So we had to cram it into a one-day process. And, and if you're clinket or if you know about clinkets, you know that's pretty pretty hard to do because we like to stretch things out and and uh, pretty hard to take a microphone away from a clinket. <laughs> but if you see on this. Uh, on this uh, very first uh, couple, uh, just right below where the, the uh, pole is laying, we have honoring clan regalia, and I'll briefly talk about that. That's something that was not a practice down in my homeland. It's something that we bring from up here, where uh, when you are uh, having an important function, you don't just go and put on your regalia. You, uh, I'll, I'll explain this more later. You put it out to display on a table in an honorary fashion and then uh, have somebody on the opposite side help you put it on. Richard Peterson, or Chashvi Ish, was our Nakani, the master of ceremonies. And uh, it's very important to point out that not only is he the uh, president at Clinton Hyder right now, but he is also a Kaguantan from the opposite clan. And when we have ceremonies, uh, you know, when I uh, had loss in my family, I call on the opposite side uh, to run the program. And, and uh, Richard uh, agreed to do that. And uh, somebody asked me, well, why didn't you just have John do it? He's been with you a long time and has done it time after time. Because John was the actual carver of the pole. And so we really wanted to make sure we had uh, a person uh, that was on the opposite side that could help us. And Richard did an excellent job in helping us out. The Atu table, uh, we had one for the eagles and one for the ravens. And uh, if you're uh, an eagle, I got that backwards. Eagles assist the ravens, ravens assist the eagles. And, uh, you know, we really want to demonstrate that we respect our clan crest and uh, that uh, we have not only respect for the clan crest, but you're showing respect to the other person. In these pictures, uh, they did not get pictures of uh, me putting on uh, Richard's vest, and I kind of was hoping that was going to be there, but I couldn't find any. Uh, but anyway, he's helping me, uh, and I helped him put on his vest. And uh, it really ended up becoming, you know, uh, setting the stage so that other people could do it. And so here we see other uh, uh, Suktine D clan members getting help putting uh, their regalia on. The pole journey, we call it a journey because it really was not carved in Craig, it was actually carved in Cloac. We had to uh, move it down uh, from Cloac in the morning, and uh, you know, that's six miles away. We couldn't ask the carriers to carry it that far. <laughs> We brought it down on, on the trailer. Uh, and so from the ballpark actually to the cemetery where it was finally erected is about 400 yards. And uh, it really was, uh, didn't seem like far at first, but that pole ended up being a lot heavier than people uh, realized it was going to be. And there's the pole just before we began carrying it. We have the, the uh, pole leading the way, and then uh, myself, Richard, and uh, other uh, clan members, I'll get to uh, Edward Peel. Uh, he's wearing a replica of our, our dear peace blanket, and we'll get to that a little bit later also. Here's another shot of the people that are carrying the pole. And then the uh, other clan members and families and friends follow behind. Uh, and the dance group 
uh, goes forward uh, playing various or, or singing various songs and, and uh, marching along, keeping us moving. More of the caring. And uh, we're coming up on the cemetery now on this particular picture. Very important to have somebody in charge and the gentleman off to the left on the top, uh, he's raised uh, 30 poles. And it was very critical that we have somebody like that because like, like I mentioned, we we're crunching time. And so he pretty much knew not only uh, how things were going to move, but he knew uh, what material we needed so that people could, uh, you know, the cross horses or the saw horses to put the pole on to take a rest and how long the poles are going to be to carry. All those things, uh, it's good to have people that have experience. And then I show a picture of the uh, part of the crew that uh, helped uh, put the, put the uh, pole to its mounting. Raising the pole by hand ended up becoming the methodology, whereas we had a uh, we had machinery there originally, and we were going to do it that way. Uh, the uh, people that were uh, doing the raising of the pole didn't want to do it that way. They wanted to do it by hand uh, because that was the traditional way uh, historically. So that's what they ended up doing, pulling it up by hand. And uh, you can see uh, on this picture, uh, the guys on the side of the ropes, they just held it uh, from going one way or the other, and the guys in front uh, pushed it up. And this is the final part, is to drill holes in the um, pole so that I could mount it to the, uh, the support pole that is behind it. Uh, our carver, John Rohn, doesn't like to watch this part. He doesn't like to see the holes drilled in. His hard work, so he, he doesn't watch that. Anyway, that was the pole that was ridden, that had that once it's been raised, and uh, made me very happy. We have a, a very uh, condensed program at the site, uh, but uh, it ended up becoming a little bit more involved because we had good weather. And we had some options that uh, we could uh, shorten things up by not having uh, some of the speakers at the end if we ran into bad weather. But we had excellent weather. So like I mentioned, we had uh, a bunch of clinked speakers, so it took a little bit longer. Rosita did an excellent job coming down, helping us out. Uh, but she did an excellent job before that, uh, coaching me along the way, uh, sending me some material about, uh, you know, things that were done in other pole raisings. And uh, I think it's very important to point out that, you know, even though we've been around a few years, you learn as you go along when you actually get involved in uh, working with other people, you learn more uh, by talking with people like Rosita. And when she uh, gets something in her mind, that, and then she'll go and find uh, how to refine it by talking to other people. That's one of the strengths I know about Rosita. She doesn't just assume things are going to you know, just go along. She'll follow up and, and keep working on it. I really was not sure about the spirit dance. Uh, I see Don's here. He was uh, head guy, uh, head dancer. Uh, anyway, it really added a lot to our uh, celebration and added a lot to the meaning of the dedication. Having the spirit dance and uh, bringing forth the spirit of our ancestors at this pole raising was uh, very, very well taken by the people, uh, particularly our clan. And here's me with them. One of the things that uh, 
I liked about uh, having Rosita there. She, she, she explains things very well to people. Anyway, she was also thanking me for uh, bringing the poll to Craig. And she was getting so carried away, it sounded like she was doing my eulogy. So she stopped. <laughs> <laughs> she stopped herself and said, oh, wait a minute, he's going to be around. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> so then she quit. Uh, I thought that was kind of humorous when she corrected herself. <laughs> The, the young lady that you see in the middle there with the drum in the upper right-hand corner is uh, Eva Rowan, and she is the one that uh, uh, she put the, our, our song together. Uh, she composed our song, they took an AD. And it happened at a time when I lost one of my older brothers. We had a, a Kuikin Craig and she uh, was realizing that we did not have an honor song or a memory song uh, for what's happening, a comfort song. So she composed it and uh, worked with people up here uh, in Juneau uh, to refine the wording and the music. And I was very proud of her because not only did she, uh, you know, compose it, but we now have it copied to most most of our our clan members that were uh, uh, prior to the poll, and we have a clan song now. Prior to her doing this, we did not have one. So I'm very pleased uh, to have to report on that, and very proud of of Eva for doing that. Our our clan song is is uh, Raven. In our culture, we have to provide balance when you have a an honor song or a comfort song or memorial song, if you don't have, if it's a raven song, if you don't have an eagle response to provide balance, then the, the song either floats around and doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or what some people say, it falls to the ground. And uh, it's a way of saying that if you have balance, it's more strength to the uh, song and its intent. And so uh, John, he's, a, he's an eagle. Uh, his daughter is a raven. So when she finished her song, he did an eagle song to provide balance. Uh, he also, uh, after this was done, and I didn't have a picture of this also, he, he did what's called the carver's dance. And I think those of you that have been uh, to pole raisings have seen that. Uh, where the carver is asked to come out and dance, and very often there's more than one carver, but in this case, John was the only one. So I called him Mr. Travolta. <laughs> like uh, many other things, it really takes a community to make things happen. We had the mayor of Craig there, and you might say, well, why do you want to do that? Well, it took... Uh, took authorization to have the poll in the cemetery, and the cemetery is not, not only owned by uh, the city of Craig, but they are responsible for its uh, maintenance and uh, upkeep. Not only did they give the authority, but they leveled the ground out for us. They uh, helped out clearing some of the trees away from behind so that would not be a potential hazard. And uh, so I really was pleased that the, the mayor of Craig uh, helped us go through this with the city council and get the authority to do the poll and uh, located at the cemetery. We also had the uh, local tribal president, Clint Cook. They provided the space for our dinner, helped us uh, in, in many other ways, you know, with tables and chairs out there at the site and uh, equipment. I'm not going to try to explain. Oops, I think my computer died. <laughs> but I, I'm going to go through a bunch of pictures. Hopefully, I can uh, get this switched over quickly. 
what, it, what, what I wanted to point out is that the, uh, the whole thing up, mm-hmm. just that. Yeah. Try to get the flavor of how nice the weather was and how the people were behaving when we uh, went through our ceremony. And uh, it really was uh, great to see all the people. Uh, you'll see the people up on the, on the right. Uh, there, there's actually two le- levels down on the bottom where the pole is, and then they have up there where the cemetery actually is. And so those uh, up there on the right hand were uh, up above where the poles are being raised from. And I uh, tried to uh, get pictures of myself with some of the uh, people who were there, and I really appreciated them being there. <clears throat> some of the people of the next generation We had the dinner uh, that evening, and uh, we had a, a program, and uh, here's a copy of the program. And uh, <clears throat> really was pleased with all the help we had uh, uh, bringing the uh, dinner together. And we started off with uh, a deer. And I didn't want to gross people out, but in reality, you know, we really have to uh, go after the natural resources of our homeland in order to do that because when we put together a function of this nature, we want to focus on our homeland, uh, the resources that are from our homeland, and uh, <clears throat> minimize uh, the amount that we bring in from the outside. And so these are a few things that we had on our uh, menu that, that evening. This is a picture of the hall as people are coming in. One of the things that uh, we did because we had uh, three clan members that had passed away within the past two years, uh, we did have the, uh, uh, the fire bowl uh, ceremony. And uh, that was very uh, emotional, but also I think could help some of our clan members that are, had not been exposed to that learn, you know, that it's important to uh, make connectivity with the uh, clan members that had passed away in this manner, make connectivity in this manner. I talked a little bit about the uh, Dear uh, Peace Blanket. Uh, Rosa Elby had been hanging on to it for uh, several decades. Her grandmother, Jessie Natcom, who was one of our uh, clan matriarchs of years past, she had that blanket uh, that was uh, a very old blanket, being, getting close to being 200 years old by the guesstimates, not because it's recorded. Uh, one of the things that happened at this uh, dinner is she ended up asking uh, the Alaska Heritage Institute to take control over the blanket so that it can be preserved better rather than deteriorating uh, in, in her closet or wherever she had it. So uh, that happened and uh, very, very pleased that 
that uh, could happen. Dedication of the pole really was very similar to what we did out uh, at the cemetery, adding on uh, a little bit more into the uh, spirit dances. We ended up having uh, killer whale, and then we had uh, raven uh, added on that uh, really was uh, very well received by the people uh, that, just, that were at the dinner. And by doing it at the dinner again, uh, and adding those things on because we had more people at the dinner uh, that had not been at the pole raising. And I got a number of comments saying that really was impressed. They really were impressed with the uh, spirit dance that was done. We had a Haida presentation by Lisa Lang. Uh, she's a double fin killer whale clan member. And uh, I really appreciate Lisa. She's trying so very hard uh, to keep her people in Heidelberg up uh, on pace with uh, clan, uh, learning about clan activities and our culture and language. And so uh, when she uh, was available, I, I, uh, I made sure I sent her an invitation to come and participate. In a Clinket function, uh, we don't always have Haida and Clinket. We have Haida functions where the eagles and the ravens on the Haida side will carry out their function the same way on the, on the Clinket side. And so we, uh, we're not totally sure how we're gonna make it work, but we just said, we'll just go for it and not worry about whether or not it's gonna be crossways with any, anybody. But it was a Sukhvin AD party, so we can decide ourselves whether or not uh, something is in protocol or not. We did have a lot of people to thank, and uh, like always, we leave people out, uh, but uh, we spend a, a good deal of time thanking people. One of the things that I also want to express my appreciation uh, to Rosita for was the uh, naming ceremony. We gave Clinket names to our clan members, and then after our party was over, the uh, the uh, eagles, uh, more specifically the Kaguantan, had a ceremony to give clan names away and uh, Rosita helped us out in, in explaining the importance of that process to the people who were there. And I think it went a long way uh, in making people aware of why, why it's so important to bring forth the names of our ancestors and the way we do it. We do it by rubbing money on the forehead of the person getting the name, and then that person would uh, take the money and give it to somebody of the opposite moiety or opposite clan, depending on how they felt about it. I'm not sure what they did in traditional days. Rub dry fish on their head. Well, that's the, uh, pretty much the end of my, my formal presentation. I think I'm fairly close to being on time, notwithstanding the switch of computers. So I want to say, Thank you very much for your kind attention. My name is Ed Thomas, and I approve this message. <laughs> Any questions? Good Ed Thomas. In our culture, it's really important for us to maintain social and spiritual balance. And we've heard from the Ravens, the Sukhjanadi clan, Ed Thomas. And the Eagles would like to thank him for this presentation and sharing with us, you know, what went on in Craig. So if all the Eagles would stand, First to thank Ed, Eagles. We're so grateful that the Sukhjanadi, you know, brought out all their at u. It was really, you know, very an honor for us to be able to see 
the Sukte Nedi and their ancestors brought forth. And today you also brought forth your ancestors of the Sukte Nedi clan. So we wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge that. But we also want to acknowledge the contributions of Ed Thomas. And if all the others would stand, stand with me in thanking Ed Thomas for his years of service to Native people around the state. We know that Ed served as president of the Central Council of Clinket and Haida Indians. Uh, I met him 50 years ago when he was a young teacher in Craig. I was still in school. You know, <laughs> And so I watched him move from being a teacher. He, he went to Ketchikan India, uh, Indian Corporation. We used to call him Indian Ed because he headed the Indian Education Program. And then he, he went on. He became the president of the council. And then he went on to serve as the Sea Alaska Board. And he also served as the Alaska Federation of Natives board member. Uh, I don't want to make this a eulogy <laughs> again. <laughs> but I, I just really want you to know, Ed, that we as Alaska Native people, we from the Southeast region, uh, we both Native and non-Native appreciate you. And in, in one small way, uh, we have Rick Harris and Pat Harris, who also want to thank you for, and they're not, uh, uh, Rick is not here, and he's from the Sakwedi clan, and Pat here is from the Lukal Khadi clan. And so she's asked me if I would speak on the behalf of, of, of Rick and Pat for the years of service, you know, that you did on Sea Alaska. Rick says he was very, very fortunate, you know, to, to work with you and to work under your leadership. So they would, uh, the Harrises would like to present you with a little gift. So I've asked Nancy Barnes, who is Simpson, uh, if she would uh, accompany Pat to give this to you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, she, no, she will carry it. Pat. <laughs> uh, Pat's the mama. Yeah. Always tell her. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Hi. This is done by Dwayne Pasco in 1985. And he only pulled 50s of Maina. And we were fortunate to have him. We did it. Oh, wow. And it's, a, it's, it's a dog salmon print. print. We'd like to present it to you. Well, thank you very much, Pat. Okay. Oh, Well, we'd like to open it up for questions now. If anyone has any questions about presentation? I want to audience? say, go on and say, Gunas Chish first, Gunas Chish, Atlan Gunas Chish. You know, it really touches my heart to have you here, number one. Number two, this is so special. You know, I worked with Rick for a number of years, you know, and we, we almost got along. He was on the wrong basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> he got strong, he's got real pointed elbows. We play basketball against Rick. And we had a lot of fun together all these years. And uh, Kathy will uh, agree with me that I did mention him just uh, I don't know, this morning or yesterday at breakfast. We talked about Rick and how much he meant to see Alaska and how much I appreciated his work with us. Goodness, geez. Okay. Anyone in, anyone in the audience with a question? Burning? I was curious if, if there were any unexpected challenges or insights from the process of commissioning the poll and raising it. If there was anything unexpected along the way? No, just I think uh, when you look at these posters you have up here and you look at others, so much of what was done in traditional times 
was done by the Klan, not corporations, not organizations, not states and government. It was done by the Klan. And I'd like to see us return somewhat to that. I know in monetary, uh, what we call capitalism, it's very difficult to do that. And I understand that. Uh, but I wanted to do this uh, because I really feel strongly that our clans are important to the next generation. And if we don't do something to, to uh, help them uh, know their identity and what's expected of them, uh, we're, we're going to lose our culture. And uh, it, it's important, I think, for, for us as a people to, uh, you know, to recognize the good work that some of the young people are doing right now and encourage them to keep going because that's what it takes, spreading them out. And I, I was hoping that when we had this function go on that we just didn't have uh, people of my generation come. And if you looked at the pictures, and I failed to uh, point it out, we have quite a few people of the next generation there uh, celebrating, get, wanting to get a picture with me or be, have their picture taken participating in something else. So that's a long answer, but I really think that uh, when, when I was doing this, there were all my nephew, nieces and nephews were calling me uncle, and that's my responsibility to move things forward, to try to educate, and I hope other uncles will do the same thing. To, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to Ricardo before this set. Uh, while we have a lot of interest, there's a reluctance to go forward and uh, to take on that responsibility or to even the, the responsibility of identifying someone to go forward. And I kind of understand it, but the other, on the other hand, I'm trying to get them to understand that once people like myself are gone and, you know, that can't uh, coach them along, they're going to have a hard time. And, uh, but it's, it's very difficult. And I hope that uh, when we bring the young people in here, that we will emphasize to them we need to have that, uh, what's that called, uh, Shade Ekani. Yeah, be the clan leader. Yeah, it is, it is uh, hard to find time when you're a young person trying to not only make a living but to increase your knowledge in other areas and to compete in capitalism. Pretty tough thing to do. And, and uh, you know, I think that providing the information, they can make their own choices. But uh, encouragement is very important, I think. Just encourage wherever you can. I think, you know, I was talking last night with Melissa, you know, because uh, one of the things that happened uh, when I was getting, getting ready to get on the plane to go to Craig, I got a letter, um, and I'm trying to remember her name now, Loretta, Loretta Pittman sent me a check 50 bucks saying, I can't make it, but I want you to succeed. Here's my contribution. And uh, the reason I mentioned M Melissa is because I went to a party in Angoon, and the clan members, they come forward and they help with the expense, whether it's $2, $10, $20, some even more. But uh, they get together and they talk and they bring forth the money to help out in the thing that you're talking about. I wanted to do that, uh, uh, you know, uh, to try to practice that and 
Craig, but I felt it would distract from really what I was trying to bring about in the first place. So we didn't do that. We did help out the expense of bringing uh, Rosa Elby up from south because she is a very important caretaker of our blanket. Uh, but other than that, we really didn't go through the process that they go through in Angoon or even here in Juneau. Anyway, thanks again. Um, I looking at my time here, and I had one one minute left, but I guess I'll <laughs> donate it back. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about the poll and my clan, and uh, my personal feeling about how our our culture is going. In certain areas, we're doing so well. Some others, we're we're reluctant, and uh, it's going to take communication of this nature uh, to bring about the kind of involvement that I think is going to be necessary uh, going forward into the future. And uh, I really thank you once again for uh, this happening here today.